the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. This is a pretty good day for me because two of my favorite parts of the Scriptures are coming together. It's both said on the same day, both being able to be heard here in this beautiful mission parish that I love so much. St. Paul says, It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Now that's a beautiful thing to hear and also kind of hard. Because how many times do we want to take control of our life? Do we want to go and seize all of the good things of this world, our gifts, our treasures, our blessings? How many times do we want to go and get those things and say, I did it myself? Quite often, we have to go and say, I am the greatest at this. I am the one who raised our, I don't know, attendance to whatever number. Well, that's not what Christ is asking us to do. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I was really aware of this saying at my ordination. And I think at our last uh, Know Your Faith class, which is every other Tuesday night, meeting in Unwind Cafe, everybody from the parish and beyond the parish is also invited. I shared a picture of the moment at my ordination where they take the, the, uh, the bread, the body of Christ, and they place it into the hand of the newly ordained priest. And the bishop says, this is the flock that's entrusted to you. And at the end of time, it will be required back of you. So the flock that's given to me, particularly as Father James, the guy that gets to stand up here and talk all these minutes every week, you're not mine. You're my friends. You're my co-workers in the vineyard. You are Christ's. I am Christ's. Just here to do his work while we are blessed with this gift of years we may have on this earth. At that moment, I knew that I would never have to go to a job interview and brag about my accomplishments and say how great a priest I was. How ridiculous does that sound? To be able to say, I was the greatest at being the most humblest. Right? It's one of my thoughts. Like, the person who's the most humble in the world, can they say, I'm the most humble guy in the world? That's a paradox for you, right? I think somebody over here tried to. <laughs> It is not about us. It's about us as a family pointing towards the, the one who loves us more than we even love our own selves. When we devote ourselves to our piety, when we become lovers of the God who loves us, then we cease to do things for a selfish purpose. We no longer want to gather all of the treasures and gifts for ourselves so that we can take them away from other people, we are now blessed with many gifts that we can now share or even give away freely with everyone around us. Whether that be monetary or just the compassionate touch on somebody's shoulder when they're sick or ill or have lost a family member. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Then the question is, have we prepared a place within ourselves where Christ can call home? In the pre-communion prayers, we talk about preparing our heart as a throne for Christ to come and live, even though the house that I have created, the temple that is my person, has been utterly defiled so many times. Now just to clear that up, right? Don't raise your hand. I've had you do that before. I guess it wasn't nice. Who here has sinned sometime today, in the past couple days, at any point in your life? Everybody has sinned. You didn't have to raise your hand, but I thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Don't look. Don't ever look when somebody confesses their sins. You want to hide the sins of your brothers and sisters. You don't want to be there to say, look at this guy, he's worse than me. Then it becomes about the person doing the screaming, doesn't it? No. Like Noah's sons, we want to walk backwards and cover the illness that is being shown. We want to live for the other. Love, this is the shorthand definition I use a lot, 
marriage preparation, and all of our class, love is about giving everything that you have to the other person. We've got babies here. We've got parents. Love is about the other, right? All you parents, you're well rested and got eight hours last night, right? Yeah, you better not be shaking your head. Yes, she'll be mad at you. <laughs> it's about giving what we have. And in fact, we have nothing. We came into the world as little babies and we needed somebody there to wrap us in warm clothing and to hand us to our mothers. At the end of our life, we will need somebody to wrap us up in that same sort of shroud and put us back in the earth so that we can go to our Father, God willing. And in today's parable, my other favorite part of the New Testament, we got my favorite verse from St. Paul and my favorite parable, the rich man and Lazarus. It's not, you know, Frank and Lazarus. The rich man has no name because he has achieved every gift, every blessing. He's achieved his fame in this life. And what happened to it? It died. It says that when Lazarus died, they both died kind of within about the same time, or at least they died within the same parable. Lazarus died and was brought up to the bosom of Abraham, meaning he went to go be with his ancestors. He went to go and be in the kingdom of heaven. And it says that the rich man went down to... There goes the effect, huh? It says that the rich man went down to Hades or to hell, depending on the definition, the uh, translation of the scripture you're using. He achieved every blessing that he would ever want in this life, the rich man. And yet, what he found and held on to as his ark of salvation was fleeting riches and money and wealth and good food and spitting and stepping over the beggars. At his door was a beggar. Why was Lazarus poor? Why was he sick? Why was he covered in source? We don't know. But it says that in this life, he, he felt many evils, while the rich man felt many blessings. Both the good and the bad, the blessings and the evils that come into us in our lives are opportunities to come closer to Christ, both of them. Lazarus suffered through the terrible things that happened to him in this life. Never, never losing faith that God in the end could heal him. Blessed are the poor, the next half of that line, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The rich don't get off so well within the scriptures. They can. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Walking through the eye of the needle, all that kind of stuff. The rich man has to take his blessings and instead of hold them and make, them, make himself believe that he achieved them by himself, our gifts, our blessings are a way of saying, Christ has given me this so that I can go and continue to bless his world with his gifts that I am a steward of for just a little bit of time. The world's been going on for, what, five, six billion years, and we're here for 70, 80, 90 years? We're just here a little time. But as the rich man would go out, full and bloated from having just been at another banquet, and this guy banqueted simply because it was a Tuesday night, not because there was any great feast going on. He just did it all the time. And I think we understand that overeating all the time can be kind of bad. We're asked to do it, right? You drive past the McDonald's to get here, most of you. Ooh, that's terrible. He walks past where Lazarus is laying on the ground, just hoping for not to be invited to the banquet, not to be able to eat with the servants in the kitchen. He's hoping for the crumbs that fall off of the table. And in that, Lazarus would be satisfied with the smallest blessing coming from the rich man outside of whose house he is set up. But the rich man steps over him. What do I have to do with this rabble, with this putrid, smelling, ugly man who clearly is not blessed by God? Ha ha. What do I have to do with him? I'm going to go about my way. I've got to go back to the market and buy another you know, meal for tomorrow. 
And Lazarus lays there in the hope that the Lord will deliver him from all of his illnesses. And we know that he felt that way throughout his life because he receives that just reward to be brought into the bosom of Abraham. Think of how endearing a term that is. <clears throat> Abraham being the father of the Jewish nation. The one that they looked to and said, this was a man, Abraham, who through all things was reckoned as righteous. Abraham was righteous. Abraham was received into heaven. And we hope that we can be right there with those people who are in God's throne room, praising and worshiping and having that eternal banquet all the time. Lazarus is brought right up. And you see it a lot on, let's say, funeral cards. You go there and there's a little picture on the front. And there's the, there's some, we use icons generally, but you go to other funerals and there's the picture of Christ embracing the person as they're coming into heaven. Anybody ever seen that one? Right? Just, it's a nice picture of saying they are being received by our Father into that paradise. <coughs> That's what happened to Lazarus. The rich man, it's a parable, but still, his name is forgotten. It's wiped from the book of life because it was he who lived for himself. For Lazarus, it is not I who lives. Because you've got to imagine, this guy felt very dead in his everyday life. He lived for the hope that Christ, that God, would heal him of all those infirmities and diseases. Now I look out at our community here. Everybody here is rather healthy. Everybody's got two legs. Everybody's standing up, feeling pretty good, as best as you can. Our illnesses that we need Christ to take away sometimes are internal, sometimes are hidden. That's why I began in the beginning. I wanted you to be mindful, and all of us to be mindful, me as well, that we sin. We fall short of the mark. Sometimes those blessings that we expect to come down from heaven, we ignore them because we think we can do it under our own steam. We cannot live this life by our own power. In fact, it's an interesting way to put it, we have no power. We only have authority given to us for a little while. When the bread and the wine turns into the body and blood of Christ, it's not because Father James has magic fingers and when he blesses it turns into those things. It's because we're imploring heaven. God, you make these the body and blood of Christ through me, a sinner. It is no longer me at that moment. It should no longer be me in any part of my life, but Christ living through me walking in this world. <clears throat> Look out at all the little kids we have here, too. Every one of them went down into a baptismal font at some point. Above the water, they belong to the parents, but the parents have made that commitment. I am now going to give this child to Christ. They go down into the water. They die to this world. They die to sin. And when they come back up, usually yelling at the priest, but that's just what kids do. When they come back up, they are alive and full members of Christ. Part of his life, his family. You remember, right? Is that what you're getting? Remember? Come back up. You're a member of the body of Christ. Have this phrase in your heart throughout this week. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And in every situation, measure it up against that great saying. When you meet somebody, when you're about to make some sort of decision in your life, is it self-serving or is it something that will make Christ alive in this world? Everybody here comes from many different walks of life. We have many different things we're going to do during this week. So I'm not going to be too specific, but I want you to meditate on your life. Where do I need to put Christ in my life so that it has that power to show the world that my actions are because I'm a Christian first? If ever you're faced with the choice of Serving yourself or serving Christ, it should be easy. 
whenever you're faced with the decision to serve your earthly masters, and sometimes we have to just to make sure that paycheck keeps rolling in, or to serve Christ, will you have the boldness to do the right thing? If we have given over our hearts to being the throne where Christ is enthroned in our lives, all decisions should be made a little bit easier. That's not to say that it's going to go easy for you. That's not to say that if you follow Christ, this random check will just show up in your mailbox and everything will be okay and you don't have to do anything. No fatalism like that. Sometimes to be a follower of Christ in this world, which has rejected Him, sometimes it will seem like we are going through many more times of turmoil and trouble here in this life. But think we've never, at least nobody I know in this room at the moment, has suffered as bad as Lazarus had and yet maintained his faith. It should be easy for us to say, it is not my life. It is Christ who has given me this life and I give it back to him in grateful thanksgiving for the great gift he will be giving me God willing, at the end of my life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ.